Hello, my name is Anne McNaughton and I'm the director of the ANU Centre for European Studies here at the Australian National University. I acknowledge, celebrate and pay my respect to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nationals, Nation Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. The ANU Centre for European Studies is the oldest research centre in Australia focused on the study of Europe and the European Union. We're also one of the oldest such centres in the region, celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. The ANU Centre for European Studies is an ANU-wide platform for transdisciplinary research and collaboration with Europe, with strong links to government and industry. Today gives me great pleasure to introduce His Excellency, Ambassador Pedro Rodriguez da Silva, Ambassador to Australia, New Zealand, Samoa, Fiji, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, as well as the other smaller Pacific Island nations. Ambassador, it's wonderful to welcome you here to the ANU and to this interview. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to discuss with you the structure and the nature of the European Union, particularly that of the Council Presidency, a role that Portugal holds during this first six months of 2021. The institutional structure of the EU is a little confusing for those outside and perhaps even those working within the EU. Uh, I wondered if you might be able to elaborate a little further for our viewers and those interested in this area on the history and on the differences between, on the one hand, the European Council, the Council of the EU, and also what it means for Portugal to hold the presidency uh, during this term. <laughs> Hello, Anne. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, you are the professor. You are the expert here. But I'm going to try <laughs> to shed some light on the often um, perceived as a confused uh, institutional um, framework of the European Union. The EU is, a, is actually a unique uh, organization because it, it combines, uh, as no other, uh, two uh, uh, characteristics. It is an intergovernmental organization, like the UN or even federal states, like the United States and even Australia, with uh, uh, another very important aspect, which is the supranational uh, nature of the European Union. Uh, this can be uh, very well uh, uh, understood when we look upon the uh, European Council. The European Council current, uh, uh, currently uh, having a permanent president, which is uh, Charles Michel, a former uh, Prime Minister of Belgium. And uh, in, 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 in that uh, institution, states have uh, full sovereignty and they uh, discuss and uh, they adopt, we call it normally summits. We organize at least four each year and heads of, heads of government uh, set the uh, long-term goals and priorities uh, uh, of the European Union in a framework very similar to one of an uh, intergovernmental organization. Mm -hmm. But then this combines with the other uh, institutional pillars of the European Union. First of all, we have the European Commission, uh, which is the branch, uh, but also the body that has powers of uh, proposing legislation. Then we have, as a very important pillar, increasingly, especially after the Lisbon Treaty, the European Parliament. The European Parliament holds uh, powers uh, to uh, adopt uh, legislation together uh, with the Commission and the Council of the EU. Mm -hmm. The Council of the EU, uh, which we are uh, very proudly exercising uh, the current uh, rotating presidency, is a sort of a council of, of ministers, mm -hmm. uh, which deals with uh, daily uh, business and, and daily uh, policies in a very operational, operative uh, approach. 
and it can gather all sorts of different uh, uh, ministers of different sectors of different areas uh, uh, and it runs the daily life of uh, the European Union together of course with the European Commission we uh, are very honored uh, uh, to have this responsibility it's a huge responsibility to manage uh, the the agenda uh, of the European Union in that uh, particular um, aspect uh, but um, it is also uh, uh, a way for each of the European uh, Union member states uh, to uh, play the role of honest brokers and not being represented each state and defending national interests within the Council of the European Union, but uh, negotiating and trying to uh, make sure that the Union is able to reach common positions. Uh, so, uh, it's, to sum up, it is really in a nutshell, uh, but to just give you this idea of the, the unique nature of the European Union, combining, hopefully harmoniously, uh, this uh, inter intergovernmental and supranational characteristics that made the Union, uh, makes the Union really, really unique and uh, the European uh, project very much, very much alive and uh, something uh, to, to, to follow closely, even for the, for the outside world. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And we, I mean, we have a long standing relationship with the European Union, which is becoming a little more formalised uh, at the minute through a, a formal free trade agreement negotiation. But as you say, this um, balance of the intergovernmental nature of the EU, where all of the member states participate so actively in the institutions, and then the supranational perspective, where the Commission has arguably a stronger role, uh, is, a, is unique and a really valuable one for balancing, on the one hand, the particular interests of member states, but then the overall interests of, of the union as a whole. Uh, and I can imagine that, as you said, having the responsibility but also the honour of the presidency for Portugal is, is significant. Um, it was, I think, uh, 2007, so 14 years ago when Portugal last had the presidency. And it was during that time that the Lisbon Treaty, which introduced significant uh, uh, changes and um, amendments to the earlier structure of the EU, so the Lisbon Treaty being signed and entering into force in 2009. Looking back over the time that's passed since Portugal had the presidency last. Would you share your reflections with us on what you <laughs> what you see and and how you perceive that uh, both the EU as a whole and also uh, Portugal and uh, member states within that have have developed? Yes, and it is it is indeed a world apart uh, what we have today if compared with two thousand and seven. Um, the uh, the EU evolved in a way deepening. Uh, is uh, union uh, characteristics that it, it makes presidencies hugely different from uh, what it was back then. Uh, I was already uh, in the diplomatic service, I'm a career diplomat. So uh, in the perspective of daily work, it's nothing to do with what it was in 2007. Um, I can give you just, uh, just a couple of examples. I, I, I already uh, mentioned and stressed that we now have a permanent president of the European Council. Uh, but that happens as well with the Foreign Affairs um, Council, uh, which is now chaired and presided by uh, this uh, new position of the High Representative for Foreign Policy and uh, security policy, foreign affairs and security policy, which is a former uh, foreign affairs minister of Spain, Mr. Josep Borrell. And uh, 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 apart from that, the role now played by the uh, European Parliament is much, much deeper. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, characteristics of running daily business of the EU changed entirely. At the time, 
the presidency organized and chaired uh, all uh, meetings, uh, ministerial, international conferences, organized the agenda. Uh, so in, 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 in terms of workload, it's completely different. Uh, essentially, uh, the nature now is, uh, is uh, much more the one of uh, um, uh, uh, things uh, being organized from uh, Brussels and the presidency uh, playing a supportive role. Uh, of course, that this is, this is uh, much more visible and intense internally because the role of the presidency is to try to harmonize different uh, member states' positions towards uh, common goals and objectives. And in terms of external um, visibility and protagonism has nothing to do with what it was in, in 2007. Mm. Of course, uh, we are very happy about it because that means uh, a deepening and, and, and the strengthening of the European idea and the European project. And uh, we think uh, we, we really are, are, are strong believers that the European U Union uh, goes in the right direction and it is stronger as uh, it has never been. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but you are, you are absolutely right. Today is nothing to do with what it was <laughs> back then in 2007 or even before. Yeah. <laughs> I understand as well with the, the amendments that were introduced um, in terms of the presidency of the council, a, a, a trio presidency program or a process more formalised now in the, um, in the treaty system that facilitates the smooth transition from uh, member state to member state in terms of the role of the presidency. I wonder if you might be able to elaborate a little on that. Case. Yes, of course. It, it, it was actually inaugurated uh, back then, after uh, in that period of 14 years ago. The first trio was exactly Germany, Portugal and Slovenia, oh. as uh, it is uh, today. And that permit us to uh, set longer term goals and priorities uh, for, for the European Union uh, within that uh, frame of 18 months instead of being just uh, six months. Um, but uh, that said, uh, doesn't mean that uh, each presidency doesn't have uh, its own uh, role uh, and uh, we have our own uh, priorities for our six months. Uh, we, uh, the main uh, direction is to try to deepen um, the social uh, dimension of um, the European Union. But you, you, you are right, it, it facilitates operationally uh, uh, daily work to have uh, this 18 months uh, perspective uh, and uh, and 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 uh, this uh, uh, it proved uh, very uh, useful, and it adds uh, value efficiency mm -hmm. to the, to the to the daily work the of, of 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 the union. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and I can imagine as well with a membership now of twenty seven member states, there are quite small states as well as the very large ones, and also the more middle sized states. This structure must also be very um, valuable for those smaller member states in terms of the support they can get from the other other states as well. Y yes, that, 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 that's correct. Um, nevertheless, as I said, the workload is, is not what it was. Uh, um, and uh, things are, are organized pretty much uh, with, with Brussels as well, mm. with uh, the, the structures of, uh, of headquarters. Uh, and there is this uh, sense of uh, belonging and each uh, member state helps the other. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the idea of the trio as, as that purpose uh, as well, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, just moving now to a closer um, relationship, which is that of Portugal and Australia, because our relation or the relationship of our two countries actually predates Portugal's membership of, of the EU. And I, I wondered if you could share with us um, some of your perspectives on this um, long standing relationship. What, in your view, are the strengths of our relationship with Portugal? Wes, you, no, you, you are absolutely correct. And it, uh, it predates and it goes deep in history, not 
would not like to enter this uh, 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 discussion among historians uh, on if the Portuguese were the first to arrive or uh, to these shores before the Dutch. <laughs> but, uh, but the thing is, even before the formal uh, establishment of diplomatic uh, relations over 60 years ago, uh, we had already uh, very, very strong links. Uh, we uh, have this very, very old defense alliance with uh, the British Empire, and we were allies during the, the, the Great War. And uh, we fought alongside Australians uh, in different battle fields uh, afterwards. Uh, so just to, to give you one idea how, how deep it is. Um, now, Today, uh, what can I say? First of all, I would like to underline is this uh, the contribution of the Portuguese community to this remarkable, amazing multicultural society that Australia is, is, is an asset for us, of course. Uh, but more recently, there was this uh, very interesting phenomenon of um, increasing numbers of uh, Australian tourists visiting Portugal. And uh, in the year 2019 alone, over 100,000 Australians visited Portugal. And, and that, of course, adds uh, mutual knowledge, uh, awareness uh, on, on both countries. And it's, it's, it has been very, very interesting uh, to me to realize how, how deep it is, that knowledge. Uh, of course, that the Portuguese custard tarts are an integral part of daily lives of Australians or the, uh, the Portuguese chicken. But these people-to-people -people contacts, as much as they are intensified, um, they uh, provide us with uh, very interesting uh, business uh, opportunities and even in investments. We have several cases of Australians uh, visiting Portugal, falling in love with the country, decided to invest, decided to stay. Um, then here, of course, we have uh, uh, very interesting ex examples of, of Portuguese investment, uh, starting with, with the cork. We are the biggest producers uh, of cork in the world, and we, we have uh, uh, Amory cork based in Adelaide trying to convince Australia that uh, Australians that nothing replaced the, the, the plop when you open a nice bottle of, of wine, hopefully Portuguese, although Australian wines are phenomenal. Uh, and then we have uh, as well a vision box, uh, uh, a technologically advanced uh, company who does the, the, the biometrical automated uh, equipments mm -hmm. for border management. Um, but, but having said that, uh, what is important for us uh, as well is to try to uh, put in value what we believe to be the, the special characteristics of, of my country. Uh, we are uh, proudly members of the Portuguese-speaking countries uh, community, the CPLP, uh, together with nine countries around the world. Of course, we always remember about uh, the big, this big uh, powerhouse and cultural superpower of Brazil. But we have this very dear to us neighboring country of, of Timor-Leste, mm. that uh, it is proudly a Portuguese-speaking country in this, in, this, in this part of the world. In this uh, bonds and historical links that my country has a little bit ar around the world are, we like to believe it, an asset and an added value yes that we also uh, are very proud to put in value and to bring at the service of the European Union itself. Okay. Uh, and um, believing that this uh, special characteristics of us being a, a bridge builder around uh, the world, uh, we are members of the uh, Ibero-American Conference for obvious reasons, and of course, the European Union, uh, this asset, this added value is interesting not only I mean, for the European Union, uh, but in our relations with, with Australia. Uh, and I already mentioned uh, the obvious case of um, uh, Timor-Leste, uh, but in Africa, uh, there are six 
Portuguese speaking countries, very uh, the main ones being in uh, uh, Southern Africa, mm -hmm. Angola and, and Mozambique, which give us a very special and particular level of understanding uh, about that uh, continent and uh, uh, playing that role within the international arena uh, is uh, something that we are very keen about and uh, that we are continually um, uh, uh, you, uh, intensifying or, or, mm. or taking advantage of in our bilateral relations yeah. with countries such as such as uh, such as Australia, as you know, yeah. uh, the ANU is organizing together Indeed. with uh, the Portuguese-speaking countries group in Canberra next week the uh, uh, World, uh, Portuguese Language World Day, uh, as declared by UNESCO. This is going to be the second year that the Portuguese Language Day uh, is celebrated as a World Day. Uh, and uh, we are talking about a language spoken as a mother tongue for over 260 million people around the That's world. Uh, and uh, uh, this global language is, um, is, is, is an asset that uh, give us uh, certain lessons learned on the way to manage international relations in a sense that uh, uh, diversity of course, it's a value that we must uh, preserve, but uh, there are, that there are other links uniting uniting very different countries around the world Absolutely. that deserve to be explored and to put in value, especially in these dire times we're going through with this ever changing and so quickly a geopolitical uh, framework Indeed. that we are witnessing. And uh, we uh, really strong believe that organizations such as the CPLP has a, an increasingly uh, valuable um, role to play uh, internationally. <laughs> Absolutely. And as you said, uh, ANU, our centre, but also the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies and the embassies of, of Portugal and Brazil and the High Commission of Timor-Leste working together for celebrating this important day next week. And I know that our colleagues in the School of, of, of Languages particularly value the, you know, the, the, the richness and the significance of language and literature, of course, in bringing really, as you just said, very diverse peoples together through their different experiences of a shared language. Uh, so we're looking forward to that celebration and uh, our new uh, Portuguese language convener will in fact be beaming in from, from Canada where he's still waiting to, uh, know, to get I the know, travel I permission know. to join us. But what that I think signifies is that thankfully because of the technology we have available to us, we're actually able to overcome these, these geographical challenges. Um, Ambassador, you've been very generous with your time and I really am very grateful to you for being able to come and uh, speak with us. Uh, so I should uh, um, bring, this, bring this to uh, a close, but I'm very grateful to you for sharing with us not only the strengths of the bilateral relationship and the significance of the Portuguese language, of which I confess I was unaware that so many speakers across the globe share this, this language, uh, but also for our, our centre's particular interest, exploring a bit further the, the nuances of the relationship of the member states together and within the EU institutions. It's very clear that um, the EU, as you said, deepens and proceeds on the basis of dialogue, it's from the outside we often complain a little that it's um, uh, very slow when one's dealing with the European Union. But uh, as I always tell my students, this is because there is dialogue, there are efforts always on the go to, to understand and to share common ground and to yes. have this role of unity in diversity yes. as an yes. exemplar yes. globally. No, and, and if I may, uh, uh, on the uh, Portuguese language uh, World Day, uh, we are organizing, and I'm very grateful to the ANU, but it, it is uh, um, the role played by the ambassador of Timor-Leste and uh, Chargé d'Affaires of, of Brazil and uh, my embassy. It's, uh, it's very relevant as well. But the, the point I would like to, to touch upon, if I may, 
is uh, this uh, shared values uh, of um, uh, upholding uh, human rights, uh, democracy, liberty, the freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, 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 um, the freedom and uh, rules-based judiciary that are at the core of the European Union. And in that regard, uh, the relations either for, um, from the European Union with Australia, either bilaterally between my country and Australia, are, um, are very easy because Australia is above all a like-minded country yes. with which we share not only historical and, and cultural uh, links, but we share above all the same values and the same core principles that are at the basis of our societies, but not only of our societies, but for for the world and in this current international atmosphere we live in. So let me stress this aspect of shared values and common principles of upholding human rights, democracy, liberty, these are at the core of uh, the European project. And uh, these, these principles are the essence of our bilateral relations uh, with, with Australia as well. This is true. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your thoughts today. And we look forward to sharing Portuguese World Day, Language Day next week. Thank you again.